Отворете съзнанието си, за да почерпите от мъдростта и опита на успешни хора, иноватори, предприемачи, творци и мотиватори, които да ви покажат една различна гледна точка по пътя към вашия собствен успех. Има само едно време, което е от съществено значение и това време е сега. Здравейте, вие слушате свърх човека с Георги Ненов. Днес имам удоволствието да ви представя доктор Дени Райбак. Първо искам да се извиня за моя глас, който в момента не е в много добро състояние, но въпреки това вярвам, че епизодът ще бъде доста интересен и предварително се извинявам за хората, които не знаят английски, тъй като той ще бъде на английски, а защото моя гост е американец и съответно това е единствения начин, който можем да предем това съдържание тук у нас. Hi David, thank Hi. you very much for uh, accepting my invitation and joining me as the second English speaking guest on the Superhuman Podcast. My pleasure. So, uh, just a brief information about yourself. You're a clinical psychologist. You are in the field of you work in the field of emotional intelligence, and you were here uh, in, invited by um, uh, Mikhail from Mini Machines and also the American America for Bulgaria Foundation. Right. right. Awesome. Uh, and you were here in Limplum doing a speech. Mm-hmm. So I, unfortunately, I couldn't, uh, couldn't participate, but I've heard that it was a great success. Everyone mm-hmm. was very happy. So mm-hmm. can you please tell me a bit more about yourself and about your story? How did you end up in psychology? How did you choose the emotional intelligence? And later on, we'll go into why is emotional intelligence so important? Well, I, started, I ended up in psychology because I was not sure what to do for my career when I was graduating the bachelor's level. So I thought I'll take one year of psychology and that year give myself career counseling. And uh, at the end of the year, I'll choose medicine or dentistry or some profession. But after I took that one year of psychology, I found it so interesting that I thought, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to help people directly, not through medicine, through their body or through their teeth, but directly through their persons and minds. And so I decided to stay and get my doctorate in psychology. And then when I was uh, working uh, in psychology, I met Dr. Carl Rogers, who is the founder of what we now call active listening, the way to really listen deeply with empathy. He modified the medical model of uh, therapy from doctor patients to counselor client. So he equalized or um, modified or revolutionized Uh, the therapy approach from the medical model to a more personal model. He wrote a book called uh, Person-Centered Therapy or Client-Centered Therapy. And he began to make his uh, work more popular, more better known. And then he wrote a book called uh, On Becoming a Person, applying his approach to everything, to development, education, um, politics. And eventually, I, after having met him, Uh, wanted to see if we could be applied to business. So I wrote the book, Putting Emotional Intelligence to Work, because as I was writing about his approach using empathy in business and using good communication in business, the book on, uh, on emotional uh, development in business that came about, Emotional Intelligence, and uh, I realized that that's a good model for what I was writing about. So I talked. I titled it and structured it around emotional intelligence, and that's how I got involved in yeah. emotional intelligence. Yeah, I think uh, it will be interesting for our listeners to hear the story about you meeting uh, Dr. Rogers mm-hmm. for the first time uh, when we were doing our short interview uh, in the office of Lin Plum. You were just sharing that uh, in the university that you were working. You had an idea to invite someone that's very popular as Carl Rogers at that time. Right. So, uh, can you just give us a bit of a background and then tell me what did you learn from actually? Well, the, the uh, I knew I had met him when he came to give a guest, a guest uh, lecture at one of my classes when I was at uh, in college. So, um, I when I was I got my first job as a professor, I said, let's invite Carl Rogers as a keynote speaker. And uh, everybody said, oh, he will never come here. He's a big shot and we're a small college. So I asked him anyway. And he said, I don't do travel anymore because I'm older now. 
So I have to say, no, but tell me about your department. And I said, we're very research-oriented, cutting-edge philosophy, and we do this and that. And he said, oh, maybe I have something to learn. So I will come, and I'll accept your offer, after all. So he came to the college, and uh, I was his host. He was my guest. And so we got to know one another. And uh, I got to find out what uh, his approach was all about in our personal contact. I would tell him about my issues, my concerns, and uh, he was able to tell me about myself, so I, I understood how to communicate better with other people. So he taught me that, just in interacting with him. Yeah, it was, the interaction was therapy itself. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So w- w- which is the university that you're working uh, in? West the- Georgia. West Georgia. Okay. Yeah. So I was in the, the state of Georgia, and this is about an hour outside of Atlanta. So the fairly small place. It seems to me that not only in Bulgaria people are very, how can I say, pessimistic about others, like successful people coming and talking. Mm-hmm. Uh, this seemed to be the case in your university as well, when uh-huh. you were trying to invite Carl Rogers. That they, they didn't think he would come? Yeah, yeah. of course, yeah. They thought, oh, we're not important enough. He won't come here, they thought. But he's not uh, into importance as such. He just is very um, natural and very curious as a person. It didn't matter to him if it was a big school or, not, or a small school. That didn't matter to him. Yeah. And these limiting beliefs are everywhere, it seems. People do not trust that they are important enough for someone right, interesting right, enough. Right. And yeah. uh, one of my favorite saying from uh, uh, I don't remember if it was Kobe or if, if it was Dale Carnegie. Um, it was be interested, not interesting. Right. Be interested rather than interesting. Be yeah. interesting. Be no, interested rather than interesting. Be interested. Right. right so right. be interested in others, right, uh, right. not be like the clown at everyone. Right. Right. <laughs> so um, how? How did you decide to like go deeper into this emotional psychology stuff, Be- emotional intelligence? Sorry, uh, because one of your I've watched um, some videos uh, about you doing speeches on this, and you you use the marshmallow test as an example right, right. about illustrating what emotional intelligence really yeah. is. So the marshmallow test involves. Uh, this uh, psychologist, Walter Michel at Stanford University, and he had children come in and sit in a room, and he told them, if you can avoid eating this marshmallow for a few minutes while the adult goes out of the room, you earn a second marshmallow. So different, there are two groups of children. Some children picked up that marshmallow, they couldn't resist it, and they smelled it, and they ate it, and it was gone. But some other children were determined to earn the reward. And they had different strategies, and either they uh, sat on their hands, they wouldn't pick up the marshmallow, or they sang songs to themselves, or they pretended to sleep so they wouldn't be tempted, and they were able to withstand the temptation. And then when they studied these students later on, they found there's a difference between the two groups, that those who ate the marshmallow, they got into fights with their friends, they did poorly at school, they weren't good at projects, but those who were able to not eat the marshmallow, who could withstand the temptation, uh, they, had, uh, they were good socially, they had made good friends, uh, they, they began projects on their own, and they completed them, and they did better in their school work as well. And we went to enter college about 15 years later. When they were entering college, they had to take a standardized test, the SATs, the Scholastic Aptitude Test, and they found out that those who did not eat the marshmallow, they did much better on their scores than those who ate the marshmallow, and they did lower in their scores. So this one small activity of whether they eat the marshmallow or not determine their view their their future whether they were successful or not and that's one of the components of emotional intelligence the ability to control your impulse very important determinant of future success whether or not they can control their impulse it is also known this this example of the marshmallow test it's also known as delayed gratification How right do you exactly. delay the result, the effect, the outcome of the of an event. Actually, my podcast is also a delayed gratification event because I started as a okay. I, I just want to create content. I want it to be interesting for others. Right. So it gives them value, and at some point, 
reward will come. I'm I'm not rushing into it. I, I won't go to look for it. I see. And it actually really happened. I see. Just before I started the podcast, I start with uh, uh, with actually uh, telling that this podcast is sponsored by a c- company which is uh, supporting such such things such uh-huh. uh, stories uh, unveil and people mm-hmm. sharing their own superhuman perspective mm-hmm. so but this i've never done this before i've always been okay i want to do very good in my work i do a couple of weeks couple of months i'm just giving my all and i'm like where's my reward right and people are like what do you mean <laughs> so i'm it, it this also happens in the social interactions with the with the, in the couples like the love life uh-huh. and also uh-huh. it happens with your friends you do something for someone right you you give them a favor you're like what's in it for me right it's not about what's in it for you yeah. givers gain like, i like this saying givers gain but not not at, at all cost so it's like investing in a bank you yeah. invest your good will your 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 uh, Happy helping them in some way, and then you have the bank account later on. You can take out from the bank. Yeah, but this is not a. It's not the interaction. It's not a financial. Tra- it's not a transaction. It's not a. Yeah, it's more of a, a belief in trust in the future. It is. Yeah. An uh, interesting story. I, I've I've always helped people. Never realized how would this come back to me. I see. But when I had the most, um, I had the need someone helping me it was not the people that I helped that helped me uh-huh. others people helped me I see I and I see. kept doing this so some sometime if someone helps you at some point they will need help and someone else will help them I see I see it's a positive chain of events right right yeah uh, so I, I I I prefer doing this right. so <clears throat> how how did how did emotional intelligence fit into the into the business world into the well, um, usually you think of business as uh, making decisions that affect the bottom line, the profit, and uh, people's feelings are not important. That's what's the traditional approach. So uh, when Carl Rogers used his listening approach to improve therapy and then uh, to improve international negotiations, then I thought, why not use it in business? And... Uh, so we, we started talking about that, and uh, we thought, well, it could be used in business maybe. Uh, if uh, the boss was more open with the employee, then the employee would be more involved, more devoted to the job, uh, and work harder. So that was the idea. And then when the emotional intelligence came out, and they uh, described how the research shows that when people are brought into the picture with more sharing, more emotional sharing, what is the risk that the boss is taking? And if the boss, instead of saying, just go do this, the boss could share with the employee, this is what we're trying to do, we're not sure, we're taking a risk. And it's a project that uh, is, uh, is, is something that uh, und- undetermined how it's going to work out. We hope it will. When the employee feels that, the employee will be more involved and more loyal and work harder. I, I've i been on the employee and when people are like open and uh-huh. friendly and uh-huh. generate this communication and connection between mm-hmm. the boss and the employee and I've been on the other end. Right. The command and control organizations where you're yeah. like told to do stuff yeah. like in a, in a military way, uh-huh. <laughs> which I don't, I don't like. I'm very people's person. Uh-huh. So... Uh, I have high level of empathy and when I talk to someone that's not empathic at all, mm-hmm. I tend to just go away. <laughs> I just leave. I don't, I don't, I know that these people don't change that easily. Right. So right. I don't want to change anyone. Right. So you accept what they are and just go on your way. I do. Yeah. I actually do. I've never been requestful of my girlfriends, ex-girlfriends when they like or didn't like doing something it's just uh-huh. up to them i don't want to change anyone right right accept them and yeah. it's not for you you move yeah. on yeah do uh what's your um what's your position on the people that are running organizations and this concept is brought to their attention uh is it easy for them to adopt it or it's um this 
empathy and trying to build a trust between employer and employee, uh, something that you're born with or something that you just have or do not have. Can you? For the most part, you're not born with it. You have to learn this process. However, certain people are more outgoing and more emotionally expressive. And you see this uh, in children early in a child's life. You can see if they're very expressive or they're more shy, one or the other. So to some extent, you're born with that emotional expression versus emotionally reserved quality. But in terms of how you use that inborn quality, if you're emotionally expressive, can you learn to be sensitive to the audience that you're addressing? Can you learn to be... Uh, more aware of how you're going to affect them. That is learned. So the, the level of expression is what you're born with. How you use that energy is learned. All right. Yeah. And do you have any kind of um, empirical or some kind of statistics about how did this new idea change people's businesses and lives? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of research on that. Uh, one of the studies looked at L'Oreal cosmetic uh, industry, uh, business, and when they taught emotional intelligence to the salespeople, they increased their profits by $2.5 million. Uh, another consultant taught the emotional intelligence skills to insurance salesmen, and those with the training, they sold policies that are twice as uh, large as those who did not have the training. Uh, in the U.S. Air Force, they um, taught the recruiters emotional intelligence, and they ended up saving $3 million dollars because beforehand, recruiters would find people and there'd be about a 35% dropout rate. But it cost $250,000 for each person to be trained. So with a 35% dropout rate, that was a lot of loss. But once they had the emotional intelligence training, they were more sensitive to the individuals, and then the dropout rate was reduced to 5%. So the $250,000 per person was not lost. It went from 35% to 5% dropout. So that's how they saved $3 million a year. Is there an easy way for someone to start being aware? Because I think it's about awareness here. Right to be more emotionally intelligent in conversations with others? Right. Is there like something that you can start and see, hey, am I doing doing it? Am I good at this? Can I work on it? How can I work better on it? Mm -hmm. um, the best thing is to begin by practicing the process of understanding someone deeply. And by that I mean to really, Rogers talked about unconditional positive regard which is to accept a person as they are, and if you decide to listen, to listen without any judgment. So it's like watching a sunset. You don't tell the sunset, oh, sun, move over this way, and clouds move over the way. You can't change that. You can just appreciate it as it is. And he had the same attitude toward people. You're not going to he didn't want to change people. He wanted to just accept them as they were. It turns out once a person feels understood, and once a person feels that they're appreciated as they are, then they're much more open to hearing the other person and to changing if change is going to take place. So if you're a therapist, by really listening deeply and ha having the person heard, then uh, the therapy will take place more effectively. Or if you're selling, to the extent that you can make the customer feel heard, then uh, the customer is more likely to buy Because the customer won't feel so pushed, they'll feel understood. And I tell salespeople, don't try to sell a person, let the person sell himself or herself. So once you explain your service, then, uh, and you find out what they need, and you explain whether your service is what they need or not, so you're really helping them like a third-party consultant. You're not trying to sell your service, you're trying to help the client or the customer. And they feel that, and if they sense that, they know that, then it's more likely you will be successful. In, uh, in someone's romantic life, it works the same way. <laughs> it, it works absolutely the same way. Of course. When you are being accepted by your partner and not being judged, uh, uh -huh. 
everything goes very smoothly and right. Stephen Covey says that in his third habit in my favorite book The Seven Habits of the Highly Effective People that understood uh, understand before, before being understood right. Right. so um, nowadays we somehow I don't know how, how did did the society ended up being oh he's smart he's stupid he's quick he's slow he's uh -huh. he is what he is Right. And he can change if he wants to change, uh -huh. but not if you tell him, hey, you need to study because you're stupid or you're right. this, right? Mm -hmm. And um, my girlfriend, when approached me, she was very accepted. She, she was very, there was a lot of acceptance from her way. Uh -huh. And I also felt empowered that uh -huh. I am myself and I'm, I'm a great person. So this was empowered by her acceptance. Empowered, absolutely. Empowered yeah. by acceptance. Yeah. Because hearing it from someone that's not your mother and father and brother and right. people that are very, very close to you and they're your blood relatives, right. you hear from someone that sees something in you. And I, I, I am very happy because her parents are psychologists. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So this, this helps us have a, a wonderful conversation right. and communication between ourselves. Right. right. So... Yeah, but this the the example with the ex with with the sunset is very interesting. Yeah, because it shows exactly how he sees it. He sees it as something to accept and not to change. And that's that example says, of course, you cannot change a sunset. And he believes that you cannot change a person, as you say, without them wanting to change. Yeah, super. And so you asked about how you apply it in business. And the whole point of business is to make money. And that's how you measure the success of business. Yeah. And so, uh, if you're going to make money, you have to s sell your service or product. And uh, the the paradox is, if you act more like a, a third party consultant rather than a salesperson, then you're probably going to succeed more. And that's counterintuitive. It, it is counterintuitive because people think. They think that the more pressure you put, the more successful you'll be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Who was it? Was it uh, Steve Jobs that uh, has a quote, don't hire people that you tell what to do. Hire people hmm. that are smarter and you let them do their, their best. So. I hadn't heard that, but it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was something similar, but uh -huh. not exactly. I know. Before he died, he said, don't, don't uh, live life according to other people's values. To do, you only have one life to live, and life is short, so live your own life and your own values. I think that he learned a lot in the after he found out that he oh, has course. the disease, and it's a, it's a game changer in many ways. I yeah, believe absolutely knowing that you uh, you can afford everything, right? But there's nothing you can do, right? So, you know, if you have a, if you know your life is going to be short, then you get right to the existential truth. Absolutely. Uh, Tim Ferriss, uh, Timothy Ferris, has a question, in, I think in, in the fourth hour work week, which is his first book, and uh, if this was your last day on the planet, are, are you still going to do the things that you're doing right, right now? Right. And this makes you think a lot. Sure. Do yeah. I want to be uh, on my desk or I want to be with my wife? I want right, to be with right, my right, kids. Right. I want to spend time with them and just... Yeah. Yeah, there some they, people some people would continue to do it. The work yeah, they yeah. enjoy the work, which is amazing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it gives them gives them joy. You're also a book writer. You mm -hmm. have uh, uh, quite a few books. Uh, I, I'm just keen Goodreads uh, person, and I check like books all the time, and right. I listen right. to a lot of them, and I read a lot of books. Like you're putting emotional intelligence to work is your first book, right? Right. Successful leadership. Well, actually, no, it was not my first book, but uh, it's more than my I first can. book was uh, about dreams. Actually, dreams that come true. Correct. All right. How how did you decide to write? Why did you decide to write? Write that book or write, write in general? Write in general, and then how did you choose this first book? Yeah. And how did you end up writing out uh, the other the other couple? I guess books? I enjoy writing, um, and it comes easy. I, it's easy for me to write. So, uh, and I always think in terms of ideas to write about. That's how I think. So the book on dreams came about because I took a trip from America to Europe and uh, 
during the trip, I didn't realize how boring it could be. <laughs> All you do is eat and then rest and then eat and then rest and then eat. And then <laughs> That's what people do on a ship. And they socialize. And there was a discussion once about uh, events that would be impossible to explain. Like people, a um, relative would die and then they would see that person's ghost somewhere. But actually, you could explain that because if someone dies, you miss them. If you see, you see something vague, you project, oh, there's that, my uncle. So I could explain that. But there was one thing I could not explain, and that's when people had a dream about someone dying, but they had no information about it beforehand, and it was a surprise event. And how did they, how do you explain that? And I had no explanation. So when I got back to the States, I did some research to find out how many people had dreams that came true. And uh, so people responded uh, about their dreams. But if they said, oh, I had this dream, and this meant this, and that meant that, I was not interested. Only if the dream were exactly about the event that occurred. Mm. Like deja vu, but a dream. Yes, yes, exactly. And so um, what I found out is that there was a pattern that the person usually dreamt about a loved one, like a grandparent or a family member, and the death would occur when the dream occurred or within two weeks. And it was such a strong pattern that I thought, maybe these people are just making it up to fool me. I said, oh, well, that's heavy. And then there was an article in a, new, a national in Psychology Today, which is a national or maybe international uh, magazine. And in the uh, article, I said, if you have any dreams like this, please send them to me. And I gave them my address. So I received dreams from across the country. And again, the same pattern that occurred with a loved one and usually within a two-week period. So I, it's impossible. How could these people have know about the future? Or what's ha- so I thought, maybe they're lying to me. That means all the people across the country would have to get together and create this scenario in concert that they're going to lie to me, which is impo- you know, not, not very likely. Mm. So that meant the phenomenon was really occurring. And uh, according to the numbers I had, the research... Tw- uh, one, let's see, eight percent of the population have dreams that come true, eight percent, which is not a lot, but it's still significant. Mm. And I thought that would change our culture. That f- that scientists would not be able to explain that, and they'd have to accept that there's something supernatural going on. That didn't happen. The world continued as it was, but uh, here to me was proof that this event does occur. Do you think it's somehow related to the subconscious? To which? Subconscious. 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 Subconscious, sorry. Um, yeah, my mind is a bit British, so... <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. Uh, that's one way of explaining it, but we don't know anything about the subconscious. Mm. That's what we call it, subconscious. It's not available. Yeah, we cannot check. But even if, that, even if it's the subconscious, how does the subconscious get this information? Yeah. My thoughts would be that... You either you have either heard you you've gathered information that someone is sick somehow. Uh-huh. So you have this internal you through, worry. Through normal uh, information. Yeah, you just I'm just wandering around your room or someone a friend of or my family. I understand. So in you each see of these it, cases, you don't take it to account. You don't. I just, see what you're saying. I understand. In each of these cases, that was ruled out. Yeah. Not possible. They were in different parts of the country. Okay. They lived yeah. in different mm-hmm. places. And there was no indication okay. that anyone... Right. You know, yeah. I had a personal experience myself uh, about my father. I'd had a dream about my father. And uh, I was supervising another psychologist. And he told me his dream. I thought, okay, I'll be fair. I'll tell him my dream. I told him my dream about... Uh, uh, the dream was about my father based on a film, uh, an Italian film. Anyway, so I told him about the dream and I started tearing up. And I said, that's strange. Why am I sad? The dream is not sad. Why am I sad? I didn't understand it. This was on a Friday, I think. So I, I, was, I got to my, back to my office on Monday, and the secretary said, your brother called. I said, oh, what, what's it about? Said, oh, I can't tell you. I said, oh, now you have to tell me. Your father died. And I had the same sad reaction. But my father was in a different country, and I had no information that he was sick or anything. So even though that was not a psychic dream, because I didn't dream he died, but I was sad when I told the dream. So that was a subconscious process. Yeah, interesting. But, I, but the important thing to me 
was I had never dreamed about my father that I recall. I never get sad to, to dreams. So this was a very unusual experience mm. for me. And it was similar to a psychic dream in that the emotion, and from a subconscious point of view, as you point out. Yeah, I totally get it now. And uh, it's, I like science, uh -huh. but there are two things on our planet that we have not uh, gathered enough information yet. One is infinity. Uh, yeah, infinity. <laughs> uh, one is the ocean, the ocean, which is, it sounds stupid. We're exploring space, but we right, will not explore right, our right. own oceans. Right. Second thing is our human brain. Right. How does it work? Right. So, yeah. Interesting. Yesterday I was listening to a podcast with um, Joe Rogan. Uh -huh. uh, he was talking to Naval Ravikant, a very smart, very smart uh, American with Indian origin, I believe. And he's extremely smart. He was saying about, okay, we know what a cell is. We know. What a cell. A cell is. A cell is. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But we don't know what the cell contains. I mean, oh, what, what oh. forms a cell? Absolutely. So it's... How does, how does the skin know where to go when to grow and right? not continue to grow? It just absolutely. So there are a lot of things that we don't know yet. Absolutely. And, and among those, I, I include the concept of infinity. Yeah. I mean, how do you understand where the universe ends... And if, if it doesn't end, where does it keep on going? And maybe if there is an end, what's on the other side of the barrier? So infinity is impossible not to have, and yet it's impossible to understand it. The brain cannot understand infinity yeah. so yeah. far. Yeah, I, I was trying to picture my. I was just trying to picture in my head what would what would the universe look like if it was like infinite. Right, it's impossible. It is. It's really it's un un incomprehensible, right? Somehow, right. Uh, okay. So the brain does not have that ability. If it exists and it has to exist, our brains don't have that ability. Which is interesting to find the limitation of the brain. We can understand so much. Yeah, it's interesting. Yes. So um, it seems that there are a lot of things that people don't know about their brains. Um, one of the things that I realized recently, the last two years, is about when my emotion triggers, some of the basic emotions is triggered uh -huh. going back to the impulses. Uh -huh. um, I ask myself questions, and I see that you also ask yourself questions. Um, I ask myself, why does, what part of this, what leads to this emotion? Why is this important to mm -hmm. me? Why does it trigger that kind of emotion. Right, right. So I can make some kind of a logical, in a way, decision and not only go by impulse. Right. So there's a favorite quote by Tony Robbins saying, the quality of your questions determine the quality of your life. The quality of your question determines the quality of your life. Interesting. Because... What does that mean to you? It means that... I can ask myself questions about how I feel, uh -huh. where I fail, oh, I what see, I do good, I see, I see. and I can get bits of information oh, that's right, relevant right, to right. me. And that information determines what your focus is, and that focus determines what you do. I see, I see. And I'm yeah. trying to tell people that po the podcast is not giving them answers. Right. It's just giving them stories and also perspectives. Right. right. So it doesn't mean that you need to agree. Right. With what people are saying. Mm -hmm. But it, it means that you can just consider that it, this might be, might be something that's true, might yeah. be real. Yeah. Well, truth is, I wrote in a, a, an article when I was much younger, truth is a consensus of valued peers. Truth is a consensus of valued peers. It is... And yeah. then if you think, if you think of, oh, there, there's no, is there an exception to that? Let me ask you, you're an intelligent guy. Is there an exception to that? Uh, exception to that. In other words, I'm saying every, every whatever anyone knows and declares as truth, they know that because people they respect have an agreement about that. Yeah. The only exception that I can see is people thinking that they found out something that's already been found. For example, uh, let's say that you are a very smart guy and you hit your finger with a with a hammer and it goes blue. Right. And you're like, okay, I, I found this out. And you don't want to hear that anyone else found it before you. 
uh-huh. or, or this like very limiting thing that you're always right. This this is the only exception. I can see. I'm right. Uh-huh. So this kind of a, oh, from from self uh, uh, affirmed experience. Yes, right? self affirmed experience. Without, yes, uh, the input of others. Mm. But we live in a society. I see what you're saying. So if someone's in a jail cell by themselves. They'll experience something. Yeah, that's a good point. Very good. Very good. You get, you get points from me. That's good. I, I like this about the American system because people are not judged if the, uh, the answer is correct or not, uh-huh. if it's right, correct or right. It's about how they think and can they just say, like, make it clear why do they think like this. Right. right. So this is some interesting that I've had on a podcast I had a guest that was uh, studying in the U.S. Uh-huh. as a kid, and he said, "People there are not judged on like this is the only the one the one and only correct answer. It's about how they think, uh-huh. and do they consider other ways of explaining stuff? Uh-huh. Why not? That there are different ways of explaining. Yeah, things. because in Bulgaria it's like there is only one correct answer, <laughs> and people are therefore being." given bad marks in school. But most of the people with bad marks in school end up pretty high in, in life. So in other words, there's something about the educational system which yeah. fosters uniformity, and I guess left over from the communist years where things Absolutely. have to be, look, be a certain way, and that continues to affect institutions if there's no change made. And the educational institution, which the teachers, the same teachers that were here that are here now, that were here then, yeah, they, they still students. have the communist style, which is this is the right answer yeah. and no exceptions. Yeah. And now the things are changing. Yeah, okay, that's helpful. Yeah. I see why, because you said I'm giving you points for that. Right. right. Because I, I, was, I found out about something that might be outside the, the quote that you said. Right. The, but I, I realized that I am very big fan of uh, of this saying that I know that I know nothing. <laughs> uh, it's a paradox of uh, Socrates' paradox. What kind of paradox? Socrates. Socrates. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. He knows that he knows nothing. Right, right, right. And uh, when you end up in a conversation with a guy that you consider intelligent uh-huh. and he wants to be right, <laughs> you realize that your conception of this person is probably wrong or well, with his limiting belief you cannot you cannot argue with him he doesn't want to argue with you he just want to win you might be interested in this that recently during this week uh, I've come up with the concept of ego a lot mm. I thought about it in the past but I never talked about it in front of a group and for a certain reason it came up at the beginning of the week and I kept bringing it up because I got an interesting reaction I try to explain you know people say why are people uh, rigid about their choices. Why are they stubborn and mm. not changing? And uh, I explained that the, we have the ego, and when you listen to someone in a rigidian way, you have to take your ego and temporarily put it aside. Otherwise, you have your own values that interfere. So if you take your ego and put it aside, then you're free to enter into the other person without any judgment. And uh, so you can do that, and you really try to be the other person, not just see what they're like, but actually be that person by entering the person's brain and say, okay, I'm George, and how do I think? I'm listening to you and say, well, how does George... I say, okay, now, now I'm, I'm not David, I'm George, and I hear George saying this, and I, I want to be even more expl- explanatory of George, even better than George can. You follow me? And then when I'm finished, I can put my David ego back on. But now I have the additional information of George. So I've been, I've been using that concept and trying to explain what ego is as well as I can. And what I, the best I can do is say ego is the history of decisions I've made that I judge to be right decisions because nobody intends to make a bad choice or a bad decision. You don't say, I think so now I'll make a bad decision. It's not human nature. Human nature is I've got to make the right choice to survive and do well. And it's based on past decisions that have been successful or you, you know, your experience of life and so there's a narrow uh, path that is determined by your ego over past experience. Like we're talking about the communist, the communist way had a certain style, and you made the right decisions to yeah. appease the communist 
power, and you continue that way. Even when they're gone, that's your experience, that's your ego. So how can you... It's very difficult to change your ego or your past experience, Mm. because that's all you have. You don't have someone else's experience. And now as I'm talking, I'm realizing that the only way to change, or one of the ways to change, is to let go of that consciously, and become. I become George, and now I can really change my perspective according to who I'm with now, directly experiencing you without reserve, without any having to deal with my values. And then I, after that, and I really understand, and I make sure I, I, I am you, not only hear you, but I am you, then I say, okay, I got it, we're finished, now I go back and put on my own ego. Mm-hmm. Now we're again, two separate people. But I have visited you, and now I know you better, and now we can we have better rapport, and we can work together better. So that's how you apply it to business, going back to your original question. Yeah. How do you connect with the other person to make business work efficiently? Yeah. Yeah. I, I always say that if you want to do something to someone, you need to like, change yourself first to uh-huh. be able to do it. Uh-huh. And when, when you were giving me this concept, I... I mentally went back to my NLP practic uh, a training course uh-huh. and there was something called th- three ways, expl- something like three way explanation. Uh-huh. It's like you have your own perspective, you go in someone else's shoes. Right. So I was doing an exercise. Right. I was myself uh-huh. and I was my father uh-huh. and I also had to go on the side to have this emotionless and very rational uh, perspective of both perspectives, uh-huh. which also You're adds up. Both your up. parents, or both you no, and, both you of and me the parents. And my, so imagine that Ellie is here with us. Right. So I'm talking to you about something that I'm keen on. Right. It triggers you emotionally, mm-hmm. and but she's, she's not in the conversation. Right. So she's com- completely logical, and emotionless, not biased by my ego, I see, not by I see. yours. Right. So what I do is I put myself in your position and say, why do David think like this? Like, what, what makes him... In the position of my father, I quickly realized, sitting in his chair, uh-huh. you need to do it physically, right. sitting in the chair of my father and behaving like my father, mm-hmm. I realized that he's talking to his son. Who wants to be his father? Uh huh. Do you get it? I, no, I don't get to it. Tell my... you're, you're the son that you want to be the father. You're now taking care yes. of him. I'm, I want to take I care see, of him. I see, I see. And my father, this is like hierarch- hierarchical problem. Right, right, right. Because right. he has raised me. Right. And, and I want to take care of him. Right. And this realization was very quick. I just sat there and I started crying. I see. I just realized I see, it so quickly. I see, I see. Uh, but then Ellie, looking it on the side, as a third person, she'll uh-huh. be like, okay, what David is saying is, is logical, what Georg is saying is logical. Maybe they're just using different words. I they see. don't They don't match each other's um, words, so they feel that they don't understand each other. I see. So this was very helpful. Huh. But it, it also adds up to your... Putting yourself in someone, someone else's shoes is extremely right. helpful. Right. It gives you context. You just say, okay, I don't know what what David went through today. Why is he sour? Why is he right. happy? So here, here's, an, here's a concept that I think is worth mentioning, even though it's not directly mm-hmm. related. And that's uh, people's experience of God. That God understands them thoroughly and completely. And therefore, God loves them. And if people are religious and can experience that, then they... they uh, they're confer- it's confirming their being, their belief system, their being. And it helps them feel good about, they feel validated and they feel better about their lives because they keep checking back to this God and uh, feel ex- understood. You know? In other words, if the process happens without another person, but just the self mm-hmm. projecting that acceptance, <laughs> I, which makes religion very powerful for those who believe it. Yeah. It's self-reinforcing on a daily basis. 
the more religious they are, the deeper the commitment. It is, I believe, therefore I believe that God lives in everyone. Right. Like but having, on the negative the, side, when you get to a fundamentalist like the ISIS yeah. group, mm-hmm. they believe so strongly in God, they're willing to give up their lives yeah. for, their, for the benefit of the yes. religion, and therefore killing others yeah. is justified. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Uh, this affirmation is. Uh, very, it, it could go in the wrong direction. It can go. Yeah. 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 It uh, for me, everyone needs to to have a belief in something. Right. Uh, so everyone chooses what he believes in. Now, why is that? That they have to have a belief in something to confirm to get a validation of their, I, of their choices. Yeah. So if it's built into the religious belief. It's self-reinforcing, it's strong, it makes them feel better. Mm -hmm. Because actually all religions are, most of the, okay, the Judaist religions like uh, uh, the Muslim religion, Islam, uh, Catholic and uh, Judeo-Christians, Judeo-Christian religions, they believe in the same thing, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah, same values. Same values, same thing, it just has different names. Right, right. So, right. This, when I was uh, probably 16 year old, I was thinking, uh-huh. okay, if, so, there should be something that people want to believe in, because mm-hmm. you cannot get out, you cannot become civilized unless you believe in something. You need to, like, everyone has formed gods, even from old, old age. They have, mm-hmm. uh, storms were gods, sun was a god, right, the moon right, is right, a goddess, right. the rain, the, everything. In order to understand nature. To understand nature. Yeah, but they actually yeah. wanted uh, to think that there is something that knows everything. Right. And actually, what like God helped me basically means, George, help yourself. Oh, I, see, I see. And believing in yourself. This is, of course, my understanding, which is quite... like. Hard to understand to, to explain in English, especially mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. with a psychologist right, right, with me. Right. But I believe that God lives in everyone, sure, and you're sure. praying to yourself. We just explained that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah, absolutely yeah, agree yeah. with that. Okay, why why is it important for people to visit therapists and discuss their emotional roller coasters? Because we are formed from early childhood. We have experiences that we did, don't even remember that form us greatly in our lives. And prevent us from being happy, prevent us from uh, enjoying stuff that's good and happening to us, or makes us feel and believe that if it rains, it pours. Which is, if you keep looking for bad st- stuff, bad stuff will happen. Okay, so why do people wh- why do people keep visiting therapists and paying them money? No, why? <laughs> yeah, why no, should they do that? Because in Bulgaria, probably because of this, also communist times, people. People in Eastern Europe used to watch through the window what others are doing. I see. Because, you know, hey, where did he get that car from? Where did he get this from? So they were pointing each other out to, to the police, to the party. And no one wants the others to think that he's uh, sick in a way. Right. Even the people in, with disabilities in Bulgaria, you don't see them outside. Hmm. Not because they don't exist. It's because they're... Staying there so, like, no one knows. Less people know about them. During the communist regime or even afterwards? I am born in 1986, so I was just born before the communist uh, regime. Oh, but are you saying this is still true? Like, now it is, it? yeah. So I'm guessing it's because they are hidden, they're kept... Yeah, they, they just stay in their homes and don't go out. And mm-hmm. even the infrastructure is not made for them. Well, let me a- answer your question about why do people go yeah, to therapy, yeah, yeah. that's an interesting question. And I think there are uh, two reasons. One of them is that we are a herd anim- uh, species yes. that we yes. need to be together. So you never, if you look at history, you never hear of one person living alone. It's always in tribes and together. And so we are, we are herd animals. We're not predators, we're prey. And we live together for safety. I mean, we're also predators... Actually, we're the only species that are both, or one of the few that are both. Yeah. But we need one another. Yeah. It's hardwired in us. And so as we became industrialized, and instead of living in a tribe, and we saw each other every day and had contact all the time, about our feelings, people would have a bonfire at night, they talk, sing, connection, emotional connection. We don't have that anymore. We have the TV, 
and we have uh, social media now, but we don't have person-to-person openness as much as we did pre-industrial. Mm. So because we have separate houses and apartments, so we don't see each other except when we're working, and even work is structured, we need very much to, uh, to get a sense of connection. And if we can't do it with our friends enough, then we go to therapists to get that deeper connection and validation. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great point. I, I did not consider this. While I say that my therapist feels like talking to my father, uh-huh. because I cannot talk like this to my father right, like right, in this right. way, yeah. uh, I now made it, it more, all made sense. Mm-hmm. Because it really is a deeper connection where you feel safe. Right. You feel that you're not being judged. Right. Which is like probably mm-hmm. two of the most important things. Mm-hmm. Therefore, you build trust. Right. And you can share everything. And as soon as you can say it, someone can help you. And I'm wondering, maybe I'd like your opinion on this, that as we get into the millennial culture mm-hmm. with more um, contact uh, on the social media, that in, in some ways we have the opportunity to be more open. And I, I'm, this is a question to you. I don't know. You're younger than I am. Is there an opportunity for, more, for deeper sharing in social media, not with everyone, but with some people where we can uh, take time to be more open. Social media allows you to quickly filter and find people that are inter- interested in the same things that you're interested right, in. Right, so yeah, common so, language. Which is, yeah, common language in, and co- also interested in different topics like books, which mm-hmm. specific books, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and so on and so on. This That's why there are Facebook groups with millions and millions of people uh-huh, uh-huh. and also this also influences a lot about partnerships because the market like clean quotes the love market mm-hmm. is now millions of people right it's not right. only the people in your neighborhood not only your the whole world. students it is the whole world right you can literally chat with someone in australia and fall in love if if you have you create this deeper connection, but first of all, you found each other through right, right. common interest, in a way. And then the virtual lives. They are, <laughs> up until the moment that you meet each other and see right. if, if this is the reality or something that you thought it is really right, a reality, right, right. which is a different thing. Right. We live well, yeah, in our about virtual lives where you enter into uh, some kind of game, I don't know what you call it, where yeah. you have a virtu- uh, what virtual... Virtual self. It? Virtual yeah. self or uh, anima, what do you call it, anime? Yeah, like Avatar. Avatar. Yeah, Avatar. And that's, like, life is more interesting than this one. This is what Avatar did in the movie. Yeah. yeah he became yeah. his Avatar. He, right. he didn't want to go back Which to movie his is that? Avatar, Avatar, the movie. Uh-huh. Uh, it was uh, a guy who was disabled. He couldn't walk. I see. He I was see. living as an Avatar on another planet. And he fell in love with a lady there. But he can walk there. Wow. And he was... Uh, on, a, on a wheelchair. Right, 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 right. And also, yeah. So to the extent that you have the, the opportunity to enhance the experience through mm. visual and so on and, and whatever, yeah. there is a choice to live an alternate life. There is. and some, But you can also do, experience this through drugs, through right. alcohol, and through video games. Right, right. And also so there's, there's, a, there's a new book called Ready Player One. Ah, it's uh, Spielberg made a movie about it, just like half an hour, uh, half an, half an hour, <laughs> uh, six months back. Six months ago. So it, it was like in the beginning of the year. Uh-huh. Very very interesting movie about a guy really logging into a game that everyone is playing. I see. Most of the people are playing. I see. And it's an artificial world actually. Right. Right. And. Blizzard created this. Blizzard is a company that created games. I see. I see. Fifteen years ago, it was I called. Le- it was called World of Warcraft. I see. You get a character there. There were people playing like twenty hours a day. Right. Sleeping right. and right. playing and right. sleeping and playing. Right. And I've played this, and I know why is it so catchy. Why? Because you are this hero. I see. You have I see. powers. Some I people see. rely on you. You're very I good. See. You stand out. You're all, the your best need, all your psychological needs, or many of them, are absolutely, met. absolutely. I see. I see. So <laughs> yeah, it is. It is quite interesting. Yeah. Okay, let, let's go back to the books because we just have a couple more minutes. Okay. You also author of Connectability: Eight Keys to Build Strong Partnerships. 
um, and look 10 years younger, live 10 years longer, mm -hmm. which is interesting. Also, love, sex, and passion for the rest of your life. Psychology of champions, how to win at sports and life. Um, for me, secrets of a Zen millionaire as well. So it looks like you really like writing <laughs> books. I like writing. <laughs> They're, uh, I've, I've never read any, anything from yourself, but I'm, I've already put on want to read some of the books. Uh -huh. I just want to experience reading a book of someone that I've already met. Right, right. Because I haven't met Tim Ferriss right. yet. <laughs> and, and Anthony Robbins. So, what can you, what can you say about, like, which one is your favorite book that you've wrote? Mm. And um, then we'll go into which books would you recommend outside of your own to people that are listening to the podcast want to be want to be successful in life? Well, first of all, uh, choosing a, one of my books is like choosing your favorite child. I really don't have an easy answer. Uh, oh, the book on real estate is the one where I talk most about my background and my early, earlier years because it's a book about being Zen. Mm. And being Zen doesn't mean you don't uh, get rich. <laughs> And that's the whole point. I mean, it's really a great book. Unfortunately, it was not in bookstores. But it's about uh, going with the Zen flow and also allowing yourself to get wealthy. <laughs> and it talks a lot, the most of all the books. It's, I allow myself to talk more about my background and my early, earlier years and so on and, how my, and my travels and how all that contributed. Do travels contribute to have a better to my, to my lifestyle, to my Zen lifestyle? Yeah. Okay. Do generally travel helps people understand better the world and life? Yeah, helps me understand Zen. Yeah. So uh, here I am in Bulgaria. If you know the story, I didn't plan this trip. What but happened? Misho read my uh, read the book and he liked a certain passage we, you, do you know that story no i haven't so heard. he sent a thank you note to the, the co-author the main author uh, two authors i was the second author he said because he, he was looking he had a problem with his clients he had a certain problem he looked at all the books and they couldn't help him solve his problem and he found our book transforming communication and said, hey this is helpful so he wrote an email to renate mochnig who is in vienna and said i really Thank you for this, writing this book. And she said, it's okay if I send this to David Ryback, the co-author. He said, sure. So I received that. I said, hmm, it's nice to get that feedback. And I, I wrote him back and said, thank you for the feedback. And he said, are, if you're coming to Europe, I'll even fly to where you are to have a coffee with you. I said, I, I don't have anything on my calendar right now, but if you want me to come to uh, Bulgaria, I'll offer a workshop for free. As long as I pay my way, I'll come for free. So he said, sure. And then he checked with the uh, foundation, American mm. Foundation, and they offer, that's what they do. They try to get good, good Western influence on mm. Bulgaria business. So it was just what they like and what they do. They said, sure. And here I am. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, this is, sounds like the story in the beginning of the book. Uh, and someone says, why not? Let's why try. Not? Yeah. Let's, yeah. Uh, But I didn't say, oh, I want to go to Bulgaria. Just happened happened yeah and the week has been incredible because wherever i tell my story people love it and i've been telling the story for a long time it's the, the the timing i'm not sure what it is the timing or maybe the way of the way the story happened uh it's just uh, incredible this has been the most uh, fun week of my life did you have any expectations coming to bulgaria i had curiosity i had no idea what to expect i knew i felt good about Misho. There's something about our communication which made me feel good about him. That's all I knew. But I had no idea what to expect here. It was a big question mark. So, and I'm, and I've, it's, like coming, it's like coming to Shangri-La. Open mindset. Very open mindset. Yeah, I just think I, everything Do you is like wonderful. It? I love it here. I mean, I, you know, I saw the streets without, traffic, without cars and the small shops and the musicians in the streets, the cobblestone. It's like a fantasy. It's like going to Disneyland, except it's real. Mm. And the people are great. The food is interesting and good. Uh, I, I talk about what I've been talking about all my life, and people love it. And they, mm. it's just, everyone loves it. Oh, wow. 
one of the reasons that I really wanted to have you on the podcast is that I believe that sharing story of successful people and inspiring others to act can also be can also work when I have uh, visitors like you uh-huh. and sharing your knowledge and bringing it in. Right, right. Because right. you are doing workshops, good, for how many people? Mm-hmm. 100, 200, 300? Maybe. Like yeah. The podcast. Yeah. Oh, for like, the podcast, yeah. The podcast gets 2,600 oh, listeners see, I weekly see, I see. and it, 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 they keep growing. Uh, huh. So now we can get to more people and what, what you just share it for me it was very 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 interesting I extremely see, interesting it was like a very interesting slash therapy conversation right, right. But what do you think about this and what do you think about that and, right. and letting the ideas flow naturally and I, I felt if I had an idea that wasn't totally related to what we we're talking about I knew you would be interested yeah because I sense that you have a very open mind and a, a curious and open mind that if it's if it's uh, interesting you would sense that it's interesting you would know that you would enjoy it yeah, uh, so well, that's what uh, uh, opens me up to you and I imagine why you're successful because of your open mind and uh, both in terms of hearing things that are of interest and sharing mm. yourself I, I like to expose myself so people feel that they know me exactly and this forms a connection with them exactly and I also do uh, do ask the questions that I think are interesting because if I'm not interested in our conversation mm-hmm this is going to translate into the content and right. it won't be very, very interesting for the listeners. This right. is what I believe. Of I, course, yeah. I might be wrong. No, no, num- numbers prove you right. You're succeeding uh, in your so, podcast. Yeah. So we have two things that we need to do. Yeah. Uh, any recommendations about books, let's okay. say about psychology or whatever changed your life for... like? For I think the book, uh, uh, Secrets of a Zen Millionaire, my book, Secrets yeah. of a Zen Millionaire, not because it's my book, but I think it really, de- and other people who read it love it, the feedback I've gotten. It deals with the, uh, the union, the, the joining of Zen acceptance of life with success in life. And the other book I think might be Carl Rogers' book on becoming a person, which, uh, in which he talks about his approach to open communication that you're so good at Mm. that maybe you would take a look at. And one other author that I recommend for you and your listeners, and that is uh, Pinker, P-I-N-K-E-R, I I forget his first name, Mm. Stephen Pinker. And he writes about language and communication in a way that's very different and interesting. Stephen with S-T-I? S T E V E N P H E P H. Okay. E N. Pinker. P is in Paul. Yeah. I N K E R. Like pink. Yeah. Pinker. P I N K E R. And one of the things he writes about is consciousness and how we are able to. He calls it recursive thinking. Mm. Recursive thinking is you can talk about what you talked about. So you have an experience of life. And then you go to your therapist and you talk about your experience of life. So your experience of life and you talk about, your, so you're recursive, you're repeating at another level. And then you tell me about your therapy as a third level. So it's like layers and a layer cake. Your experience, level one. Therapy, you talk about your experience as a therapist, level two. You talk to me about your therapy. So recursive, but it's a higher level of abstraction each time which makes it interesting. So the experience of life is interesting, but, it, but those interesting things you want to talk about with your therapist, so you're distilling the more interesting things or provocative, and then you and I talk about it at an even more interesting level. That's the kind of stuff he talks about, the use of language. Sounds interesting. I, I really want to wrap my head around it. <laughs> <coughs> I think the bottom line is we are able to choose our dialogues based on what is meaningful to us. Mm. And it's it's a richness that many people don't take advantage of or or they don't have the ability or the desire. So is that an indication of intelligence or is it an indication of intellect 
actual values as opposed to monetary or business or romantic. Mm. Uh. <laughs> That's why brain and psychology has been a topic on on my on my Goodreads list, listening to and reading in the last probably two years. Uh -huh. I went through the NLP workshops. Which NLP? One? NLP. NLP. I'm, uh, I'm an NLP master. Here in the... Uh, yeah, yeah. uh -huh. And it helped me a lot, a lot. Right, a lot. right. I can self-therapy myself when something is really urgent. I can be uh, asking okay, yourself why is this happening? And, and right. just stepping out of my shoes. Uh -huh. thinking, okay. All right. Um, last question. The last question mm. is, if you can go back to yourself take a time machine and you can share something with you uh, how far back are you going to go and what are you going to share with yourself what kind of information that's a question that could be interpreted in many ways but the way I choose to interpret it is if I could go back in my life a good so I was a young person whatever that is I would be uh more supportive of I would be more I would, I would get more confidence from that awareness of time going back that I have a lot to offer and to make sure I use my ability to communicate more effectively why is confidence that important to you why is confidence? because I uh, I would be able to reach my potential of helping others uh, more effectively the potential to help others because that's really rewarding sounds amazing thank you David thank you for being on the Superhuman Podcast and hope that you liked our interview and uh, thank you guys for listening thank you Ellie for being here uh, and uh, unfortunately not taking part of the conversation maybe some, sometime soon uh, thank you Michu and America for Bulgaria for bringing you here and hopefully they're going to keep bringing amazing people like you. I hope so, because I enjoyed it, and I hope that's true. And uh, thank you guys for listening, and we will be hearing each other next week on Tuesday again. Bye-bye! Този епизод достигна до вас благодарение на усилията на екипа и подкрепата на дарителите на Свърхчовекът. Автор и водещ Георги Ненов, аудиообработка Радослав Радоев, креатив Анелия Пейчева, маркетинг Анна Мария Ангелова, консултант Неда Борисова. Както и все по-големия списък с хора, които подкрепят свърх човека, за което съм им безкрайно благодарен. Георги Малчев, Симона Дакова, Павлина Маринова, Ивай Окенов, Даниел Гочев, Йордан Димитров, Христо Христов, Теодора Георгиева, Ясен Михайлов, Любомир Киров, Ралица Куманова, Анна Андонова, Емин Мола Ахмет, Ивайло Христов, Атанас Деневски, Марин Митев, Николай Василев, Александър Силгиджиан, Емилиан Николов, Нели Димитрова, Енчо Боев, Андрей Грозданов, Димитър Парушев, Джанер Кафеджи, Маргарита Труанска, Йордан Василев, Райко Гарков, Александър Гейне, Живко Тодоров, Борислав Сандев, Галин Стефанов, Деница Димитрова, Атанас Атанасов, Висер Вълов, Мария Дилова, Християн Стоилков, Даниел Гошев, Яни Джуров, Богомила Трайкова, Асен Цветков, Яна Петрова, Георги Генов, Юриана Андреева, Мирослав Желещев, Иван Игнатов, Радислав Данев, Катерина Апостолова, Коста Атанасов, Боряна Георгиева, Надежда Гешева, Ивайло Янков, Ивайло Стефанов, Тодор Петков, Константин Спасов, Невена Пеева Тодорова, Силвина Фурнаджиева, Борислав Дончев, Павлина Андонова Иванова, Цвети Тотева, Камен Стойков, Радослав Георгиев, Помен Иванов, Лиляна Берон, Христо Бакалов, Кирил Юнаков, Поменка Матева, Кристиан Михайлов, Ели Спасова, Александър Гиновски, Мирослав Муравски, Николай Маринов, Никола Томов, Георги Орданов, Александър Куманов, Евелина Костадинова, Мирослав Филков, Мартин Ангелов, Даниил Петков, Стани Цветанова, Румен Митев, Нетко Христов, Иван Белчев, Синди Стефанова, Марин Петков и Мартина Георгиева. Хора, благодаря ви. Напомням, че в момента, в който станем 100, ще си направим едно огромно парти, за да го отпразнуваме. Всичко най-хубаво за тази седмица и до скоро. Чао!